Dear colleague, I'm glad everyone, and I hope for a, a very productive discussion today. All right, I think I will speak in Russian from now on. I would ask those of you who have come to us today to participate in our discussions uh, in the language that you prefer, because as far as I understand, we are all going to speak the same language, the language of the environment. Let me very briefly describe explain to you why the state unitary enterprise Voldo Canal of St. Petersburg decided to lead and organize this uh, meeting. Ever since the first legal forum happened in St. Petersburg, we have been actively involved in pursuing this topic. As early as at the first forum, we approached the organizers and said, out of the 60 roundtables that you're organizing, there is not a single one on environment. The Ministry of Justice uh, responded very well by supporting this idea, deciding to organize the first roundtable on, environment, on the environment. So, Vodokanal is uh, the water treatment and supply system of St. Petersburg. Our main function is to supply water and to provide sanitation services in the city. However, we know that the environment is not only water. We have misled the speaker. We announced a later time for this round table. Welcome. Well, of course, the environment is not limited to water resources. It also includes uh, atmospheric air, forests, and so on and so forth. The history of legal regulation of these uh, topics uh, goes more than 100 years back. The first uh, instrument that we were able to identify was adopted in 1875. It was a declaration between Austro-Hungarian Empire and Italy on the protection of uh, avian species. Later, a, an international instrument on the protection of the sea was adopted. But today, the subject of our discussion is water and how it can be protected. In our discussion, we are going to focus on the challenges, namely the global challenges. This is because uh, no country, no state can address these global issues alone. One of the issues that I would like to bring to the table right away is uh, sustainable water management. The the mm, core of the problem is uh, the fundamental contradiction between the need to protect water resources and the need for active economic activities. Uh, this conflict can only be resolved through a dialogue between all the stakeholders. In the case of water, these issues need to be addressed not only domestically but also internationally. These conflicts need to be resolved on the basis of law. I'm not going to take too much of your time. We have a lot of speakers here. I would like just to say that, uh, yes, indeed, uh, sustainable water management is uh, uh, a challenge that needs to be addressed not only domestically but also internationally and this is uh, evidenced, especially evidenced by the so-called transboundary pollution of water bodies. Pollutants cannot be stopped by the formal state body borders and that means that uh, um, the protection of uh, such water bodies used by several states uh, have to be a common has to be a common cause another highly important concern uh, has to do with the development of shale gas fields uh, i know that we're going to touch upon this uh, 
during our discussion. Um, but, uh, and I'm also not going to talk about the specific uh, legal documents and instruments that have been developed. Uh, uh, let us go straight to the agenda. Before I give the floor to the first speaker, I would like to do the following. I would like to ask Rita uh, Hemma. I'm sorry. Now, I would like to give your full name and title, because today we have some excellent speakers. And I would like to introduce each of them. She's uh, a consul for environmental matters of the General Consulate of uh, Finland in St. Petersburg. Rita is going to say a couple of uh, introductory words and also pass to you the greetings from Tari Halonen. Good afternoon, everybody. Just as Marina said, I'm going to speak now on behalf of uh, my president. She prepared an address in English. Уважаемый заместитель министра, уважаемая Елена Адольфовна, коллеги, я хотела бы тепло поприветствовать участников четвертого международного Санкт-Петербургского юридического форума. Новый круглый стол. Вода наследия прошлого, ресурс настоящего и право на будущее. Начал свою работу в рамках этого юридического форума. Я вас поздравляю с этим важным шагом. Жизнь на Земле зависит от воды. Вода обеспечивает стабильность в обществе и надлежащие условия жизни людей. Нашей глобальной задачей является обеспечение человечества чистой питьевой водой. Правительства всех стран в мира должны взять на себя ответственность и обязательства по использованию водных ресурсов оптимальным образом и на основе экологических принципов. Сотрудничество между Финляндией и Россией является добрым примером, которым могут последовать другие страны, решая совместно свои экологические проблемы. Водоканал Санкт-Петербурга достиг замечательных результатов в очистке сточных вод и тем самым значительно улучшил экологическое состояние Финского залива. Мне хотелось бы лично и тепло поблагодарить генерального директора водоканала, господина Феликса Кармазинова, вклад которого в это сотрудничество имел... The year of the Gulf of Finland 2014. The countries work together in order to discover ecological problems. They monitor and analyze the condition of maritime and coastal ecological and geological biodiversity. Stakeholders in the three countries will organize various events, including campaigns for raising awareness and training systems. Joint work is needed to solve the detected problems. The aim is to improve the condition of the Gulf of Finland for us and for future generations. The International Legal Forum offers a unique platform for searching for answers to difficult questions, for strengthening international relations and for an exchange of information and experiences. It's good to notice that the roundtable will have governmental and regional officials, as well as representatives of scientific institutions and the business community. I'm sure that the experts of the roundtable, water, heritage of the past, resource of the present, right to the future, will have a productive dialogue on the most topical issues. I wish all participants a useful and successful forum and I remain fully committed to working together also in the future. Tarja Halonen, President. Thank you. Now, before I turn it over to the first speaker, I would like to say this. We have received another welcome address, this time from Timo Makila, who is the director 
of the International Cooperation Department of DG Environment of the European Commission. Allow me to read this out to you. The management of our energy and natural resources is becoming ever more important. In the world where the demand for water is going to double by 2050 and where we will need 70% uh, more food, feed and uh, fiber uh, during the uh, coming decades. At the same time, 60% of our land and economists are already now degraded and under threat, both which are to provide this increasing demand for us. Global businesses have um, estimated that they need to improve their resources. Efficiency uh, 4 to 10 fold by 2050, just to be able to survive. And this is good for economy and business, saved energy and resources, save money and in the EU alone. 20% improvement will uh, generate 3% GDP growth and create 2 million new jobs. But how will we uh, manage this um, change which is uh, uh, inevitable? Rules, rule of law, and international agreements are central uh, tools for moving the world in the right direction. This is why F uh, 4th St. Petersburg International Legal Forum is such an important even touching the key uh, policies in the area of uh, environmental and uh, resource management. Let me wish all success to the conference and I am eagerly watching for ideas and results emerging from the conference. Tima Mekele. For our first presentation, I would like to give the floor to uh, Ms. Hanna Lipoka, who is the Chancellor of the Ministry of uh, the Environment of Finland. I certainly want to say a couple of words before giving the floor to each speaker, because uh, in the case of uh, Hanna Lipoka, uh, her track record is impressive. Uh, she worked for the Ministry of Education. She was in the Finnish Parliament for several years. She was the Minister of Justice uh, between 1991 and 1994. She was uh, the Governor of Lapland. She holds a PhD in law. And uh, now she's going to present on the topic of integrated water management, the Finnish experience. Thank you, Mrs. Mrs. Mm -hmm. Chair, and uh, uh, a lot of thanks to St. Petersburg Water Canal organizing this, this meeting. I am I'm personally very happy that I can say a few words about water legislation and water regulations because this is my branch. I made my, my doctor's book in the, in the University of Helsinki Faculty of Law in, in this branch. <laughs> and, uh, and then when I asked you, told my background when I was a Minister of Justice, I had possibility to renovate our water legislation. <laughs> so put in, for, in force what I have dreamed in my doctor's book. But uh, uh, coming to the to topic today, uh, the depletion of natural resources is one of the most severe global problems in, alongside climate, climate change, of course. In, in particular, the global challenges related to water are increasing. The number of people without access to clean drinking water is still about 1 billion, and over 80% of the world's wastewater remains untreated. More than 3,000 children die of 
water-induced illnesses each day. If the current rents are allowed to continu continue, global water consumption will exceed the amount of water resources available by 40% in the next couple of decades. Water is becoming a, a natural resource that is competed for. Better water consumption management can bring economic savings, and the new innovations will create new business opportunities. Uh, Water-related products and services are an integral part of important growth areas. For example, the annual turnover uh, of the European water sector is around 100 billion euros, which makes up one-third of the global water market. The figure is expected to grow by 6% every year. Often, the means of improving the use and quality of water are, are actually very simple, such as renovation of a water system. Uh, dear participants, uh, Finland has worked for, for a good 50 years towards international agreements on transboundary water bodies in the United Nations and also in the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, UNECE. Our own positive experiences of the benefits and the necessity of cooperating with our neighboring countries to manage transboundary water resources have encouraged us to promote the topic. Uh, Finland and Russia have cooperated actively in the water sector. In addition to the transboundary water cooperation, which has a very long history already, we have a, a very long tradition also uh, of joint projects. The renovation of the wastewater treatment system in this city, St. Petersburg, was a fine achievement supported by several countries and fi finances. And now renovation works are in progress in other cities as well. And we can only be very happy that everything this has, has happened. Uh, coming back to our experiences in, in Finland, uh, today in Finland, we are very proud of the cleanness of our lakes and rivers. But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this has not always been the case. In the late 1960s, uh, 40 years ago, many of our lakes and many of our rivers were very badly contaminated. The wood processing industry contaminated the waters, causing a number of fish die-offs. Our communities released their wastewaters directly into water systems without treating them first. And then in the 1970s, the Finnish authorities increased environmental regulation. An act pro prohibiting the contamination of water was put into force the environmental permits of contaminating parties became uh, stricter, and the authorities started inspecting compliance with the permits. And the industries, on the other hand, developed new technologies that helped cut down the emission, emissions rapidly. Uh, Finnish environmental legislation is still based on the same principle. It is Pro prohibited to damage the environment and deliberate damaging of the environment is against the law. Uh, my ministry, so the Ministry of the Environment, monitors and controls the environmental laws with its independent and autonomous permit and supervisory authorities. If a company breaks the terms set out in the permit, they may be faced with criminal charges and an obligation to pay damages. We have had few cases of term violations. Uh, actually, only the mining industri industry, which is uh, at the moment in the very active in Finland, has increased the workload of both legislators and authorities, because the rapid growth of the sector has brought uh, with it new production methods that challenge environmental conservation in no novel ways. But we think that we can also manage it and the companies should uh, uh, implement new technology. At the moment, uh, discussions around permit procedures and their slowness 
are uh, active in Finland. In Finland, as in other countries, the problem is that uh, large-scale projects require approval and permits from a number of authorities in addition to land use and impact assessment decisions. The process is slow, and if the decision is appealed against, which is often the case, it becomes even slower. Even the Finnish government has discussed ways of reducing companies' administrative tasks, in, in other words, cutting down on permit bureaucracy. The government has called for efficient communication between the authorities and operators from an early stage in the process. This will ensure that the operators are aware of the re report, permit and other requirements related to their projects. And authorities, on the other hand, should be able to assess the time needed for the decision making. Uh, appeals uh, are another topical issue in Finland. Our right of appeal is, is very broad and, and limiting is not easy. We are bound by the Aarhus Convention that uh, protects public participation rights as well as uh, by our own constitution. Uh, thus, we tend to resort to demanding more resources for the appeal courts so, th so that they can reach decisions more quickly. And as you perhaps know, uh, uh, we just are getting new prime minister in Finland and uh, the governmental parties are at the moment sitting together. How will they change the governmental program? And I, I think that how to, how to have, have slow permit procedures will be one topic which they, which they um, put up in their, in their program. But, uh, Anyway, uh, environmental impact assessment have also become an important channel of public participation. EIA take place at the beginning of large projects, and often the assessment process is the first time that the people living in the affected area and other interested parties hear the project. Impact assessment evaluate the social, economic, and environmental impacts of the projects and an, an environmental impact assessment is, uh, in a way, a tool for determining how a project, such as a mine or an in industrial plant, can be uh, executed in a sustainable manner. Uh, the ESPO Convention, which is also known here in Russia, uh, 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 and Finland, we are part of uh, this convention. It requires us to report projects with transboundary impacts to our neighboring countries as well. Uh, so uh, I have tried to describe that environmental regulations are changing constantly. Nowadays, most of, of the changes to Finnish environmental regulations come from the European Union. And there is sitting also Timo Mäkelä, which words the Mrs. Chair just told us. Also, new means have been developed to support, su support legislation with the goal of uh, enhancing the state of the environment, such as cutting back on subsidies that are harmful for environmental and imposing taxation on operations with significant environmental impacts, including waste production. A, a variety of target programs have been discussed and agreed upon, such as the European Union water management targets. And uh, there are uh, a lot of soft law in instruments also available as guidelines and declarations. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, finally I want to tell that it is of utmost importance that the research, research community, authorities and, and political decision makers discuss the development of the environmental regulations together. Uh, I, I strongly believe that administrative and political actors would benefit from a close dialogue with universities and researchers. There has been some cooperation between Finnish and Russian universities and, and faculties of law over the years. However, uh, there is still room for more cooperation. We could put our heads together and think of ways to increase and, and facilitate student mobility between Finnish and Russian universities. 
And finally, Finland and Russia are rich in natural resources. We have forests and we have water. In the face of the global challenges I referred to at the start of my, my presentations, we should bear in mind that the winner of the competition for natural resources is not the one who had the most to begin with it, but the one who knows how to use them sustainably. So thank you, Mrs. Chair. Thank you. Probably it doesn't make sense, uh, but it is not a question for you, maybe uh, this is a subject for our discussion today. But I would like to address it first to Madam Poco, because it has uh, been recognized that uh, the waters in Finland and Canada are the purest in the world. It would seem that a lot has been achieved. The trailblazer in this area is the United Nations Organization, and now have uh, a list of actions that have been undertaken. We know the Rio conference, uh, the uh, 20, agenda for the 21st century. There is a declaration of the millennium. There is a decision of the summit in Johannesburg. Two decades uh, have the last two decades were decades uh, were named the water for life the Helsinki rules of 1966 uh, adopted at the UN conference ten principles of on the right for water the Saragossa uh, Charter uh, since 1997 every three years the global water forum convenes its meetings and there are many many other events if we take international legislation we should say that many of the documents are of um, recommendational nature but some of them have already become mandatory what is still missing to ensure complete success in the field of water there was an initiative by three countries uh, Russia, Estonia, and Finland. This year has been proclaimed the uh, year of, uh, of the Gulf of Finland. Uh, 2013 was proclaimed by our president the year of protecting the environment. You said that we should not uh, let people have a bad impact on the environment and, and punish people, including in a criminal way. Why doesn't it work entirely? So we have instruments dating back to 1966, 1956. Many of them are mandatory already. National legal instruments should be in line with international law. Why does it, doesn't it always work? What is missing? Microphone, please. The international police. In the international framework, we need more cooperation. How to reach the sustainable use of water and in, in national level in each country, I have only three points. We need better regulation, good supervising, and for industry and, and uh, communities, um, the, the demand to use the best available technology. Can I add something? People are sitting sadly. I would like to say why don't international norms always work within countries? All the agreements and conventions that you mentioned, they uh, embed international principles and norms that are largely of a 
recommendational nature and do not have a direct force on the territory of those countries which ratified those instruments, but never implemented it, implemented those norms into their own national legislation. And maybe I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but my presentation will be f later today. And it will uh, directly deal with the implementation or rather improvement of Russian legislation in the field of uh, managing and protecting water bodies as a continuation, as a follow-up on international law. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Poka. Th thank you, Madam Kanaeva. I tried to provoke you a little bit with my question. Of course, I mixed all those conventions. I know one act, one instrument was uh, uh, signed by the Russian Federation. Some of them are mandatory, some of them are of a recommendational nature. But I never thought, working at the state structure, that so much has already been worked out in terms of instruments. And of course, we would like to go ahead very fast in order for all of us to drink clean water. Oksana Nikolaevna, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning, dear colleagues. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. My name is Oksana Demchenko. Uh, I am the director uh, of the department of the Ministry of Construction of Russia. I would like to add something to what has been said and uh, of course we are talking about uh, rules and regulations about laws and while our why, why our foreign colleagues treat this issue on a more serious level because the attitude of the simple people of the population is different the people there are concerned with the state of nature, they protect nature, they uh, care about it very much in order for us to make sure that our norms uh, start to work we need to work uh, with the population, we need to enlighten them, we need to raise their level of awareness when we have this caring attitude to nature, to the environment and it would be blasphemous for a person to throw away a piece of paper while walking along the street. When we have such a mindset in place, the norms will um, start working. Our laws are all good, but for some reason they don't bring about the effect that we expect from them. So I think that it is important that the government, the state, raise the awareness of people enlightened people change their attitude towards those problems and these norms. Thank you, Aksana Nikolaevna. We uh, proceeded from the purity of uh, Finnish waters and probably we will come back to the presentation of Hanna Lepoka, but now I would like to give the floor to Oksana. She is the next on my list, um, and she will talk about taking into account uh, international legislation and experience in regulating the sphere of uh, um, uh, water supply and water um, and sanitation. Our next speaker represents the Ministry of uh, um, uh, the of Construction and uh, Utility Enterprises of the Russian Federation. I would like to make a short presentation and focus the attention of the uh, esteemed audience on the fact that we are quite actively now reforming our legislation in the field of water supply and sanitation. And one of the uh, pivotal step forward was the adoption of the sectoral law on nine, in, nine, in 2011 on water supply and sanitation. This is very one of, um, of the very few pieces of legislation that systematizes and brings together all the norms and rules that should govern the work of uh, water supply and sanitation sector. When we prepared this uh, draft law, and was, it was prepared with wide participation of the representatives of the general public 
maybe our colleagues know that uh, under the government of the Russian Federation we had an expert council on the utility sector and as part of the work of this expert council there were working thematic working groups were set up that included the representatives of the expert community and uh, the public at large as well as representatives of the sector itself and that uh, piece of legislation that became law number 416 uh, in 2011 it was adopted uh, it was uh, met with a wide discussion and when this piece of law was being prepared we were primarily guided and were trying to implement two major international principles that operate in this field the, uh, the polluter pays principle and uh, the pollution uh, prevention must be uh, pollution must be prevented so all the norms were built around those two principles therefore in this law we have a special chapter dealing with the protection of the with the protection of the environment is in the field of water supply and sanitation it was a very serious step forward because before all the regulate relations legal relations were regulated by different legislation be it the water code be it separate act by the government it was not systematized and harmonized an important issue of this uh, law is that we are trying to change uh, the mindset, the attitude towards the status of our water canals. Before, the attitude towards these enterprises was that water canal is among the major pollution the polluters, maybe the main polluter of all the water bodies. That was the prevailing attitude, although in real life it is absolutely re the reverse the opposite because water canal is the only entity that cleans water all other sides uh, ordinary consumers or industrial consumers they pollute i also used to work in the russian utility systems company it's a private operator we managed water canals on the territory of the russian federation always came up across this problem because the main claims the main criticism the main financial liabilities that uh, arise in relation with all the violations related to discharges and emissions all of them were addressed to water canals and then those inspectors auditors they never try to understand why this centralized system uh, of uh, sanitation received those pollutants that led to these or those negative consequences. Of course, all the criticism was uh, aimed at water canal. The law 416 was uh, adopted in order to change the situation, in order to specify the work of water canals as the only specialized entity of the territory of municipality that makes water bodies purer and safer. And the second approach is that the liability for pollution should ally uh, with uh, pollutants thems uh, pol uh, pol themselves, with uh, those who pollute themselves, uh, those who discharge um, their uh, sewer into the centralized system. We believe that uh, this uh, principle, we have been successful to implement this principle in this draft law, and all those normative acts that uh, were adopted um, in relation to it, they follow this logic. And I can state that in the law, first of all, there is a norm stating that uh, penalties for a negative impact on the environment, it goes uh, to um, the budget and it comes not from the water canal but from specific subscribers. Also, there is another norm uh, 
uh, about a local purification of a discharged uh, wastewater. So before they can discharge it into the centralized system, they have to filter it and purify it because the, these uh, contamination uh, can be very specific and um, the water canal uh, purification system cannot cope with it. And there's also a direct liability to cover all damages uh, to the environment uh, from the side of the subscribers, of the u users themselves, but not um, the um, organization, uh, centralized organization, Water Canal. So on the part of the ministry, we can see our role um, that we need to implement um, and introduce into practice uh, all norms um, included into this new law. They are in line with international standards and practices, and we believe they will be implemented in the future. But this is not all. A lot uh, should be done. There are a lot of uh, problems and issues, and you, as representatives of various um, industries, uh, sorry, I did not see um, the list of um, all people uh, present here. So we all know about uh, problems of uh, fisheries. Uh, we, it's from the time from the Soviet Union. We know that there are uh, certain uh, plans, um, like planned uh, discharge of um, waste uh, water. And now um, it is regulated through um, uh, specifying certain standards. Uh, so these are standards or norms um, for these um, uh, fish farms. And in practice, we can um, see uh, paradoxical situations when water canal ha or various um, users, uh, they have to discharge water, uh, which quality is even better than um, what water canal produces. So we have been discussing this for a long time, and we believe that some positive results have been achieved because now there is a draft law, and it is now submitted to the State Duma, and it is being discussed uh, in um, the uh, parliament, and um, it is about amendments um, into uh, this law I've been discussing and some normative acts of the Russian Federation, and we can see that there will be a new system uh, to uh, certain uh, technological norms and standards that are used in um, countries, um, uh, members of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. For um, uh, water canals, um, uh, we see the following uh, changes. Um, these uh, technological uh, norms uh, will um, be uh, defined, uh, so there will be clear um, uh, description um, uh, what amount of nitrogen or oxygen is allowed, and these um, technological norms will be defined in line with um, the uh, goals of uh, ensuring um, further uh, technological uh, processing of water, de-biological uh, treatment, then uh, further biological treatment uh, with uh, taking out um, oxygen and nitrogen, and then uh, finally purification of the wastewaters. So all these amendments, uh, they um, will be aiming at uh, this new system of technological uh, norms. Uh, then um, the government the government of the Russian Federation uh, is supposed to approve uh, these uh, technological norms and also to define the uh, procedure for water canals to specify the time frame um, and uh, terms for these different stages of water purification. And investment uh, programs submitted by water canals um, in line with the uh, tariff process, um, they should include um, all um, the measures that um, ensure um, compliance uh, to these norms. So water canal uh, should develop uh, these measures, the steps and activities, and uh, then all this should be implemented. Sorry, I have a question. I have an urgent question because uh, this is so important. Uh, for my area, uh, yeah, but uh, still, uh, 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 still, um, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm as a moderator, um, yeah, so I have to um, uh, do my task. So you have just a little bit of time, but could you please um, 
shorten your presentation. One more draft law, and I'm sure everyone will be interested in this. Introduction of these in, uh, these technological norms. Um, so previously, I've been speaking about these norms for water canals, but there will be also a comprehensive system for technological norms, um, which will be introduced for all industries. And in our area, this draft law will um, specify uh, some um, aspects um, in the area of re regulation, um, especially for water canals. And now, um, summarizing uh, my um, talk, I um, can say that after studying international regulation of this sphere, we understand that there are uh, important achievements uh, in this area. And um, after analyzing these documents and looking at all these approaches that are included, we see, oh, this is for us. This might be useful. Um, so what colleagues have uh, already introduced and implemented um, at the regulatory level. I believe all this is relevant and uh, you would all agree with that. For example, what we have been discussing, the principle um, that the uh, polluter should pay and um, that uh, it is necessary to purify all industrial waste uh, waters um, before they are discharged into the municipal centralized system. Then um, there should be uh, some payments of penalties uh, for excessive uh, discharge uh, of these wastewaters, and this money should go to municipalities because uh, these bodies are responsible for water supply. Then covering damages uh, to the water uh, basins, and um, this should be uh, done by industrial uh, polluters, but not uh, by uh, water canals. And um, also, there should be evaluation of the quality of wastewaters um, in um, view of the best available uh, technologies, because uh, without this, it is uh, impossible to fulfill this goal, and we won't be able to protect our water resources. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, um, Naksana Nikolaevna. Um, really, um, we uh, could uh, devote a separate session uh, to such issues because understanding of all this leads um, uh, us to the situation when everyone uh, treats uh, their own uh, wastewaters. Yeah, okay, water. Um, objects, they are in the end, and uh, all industrial users, uh, they should uh, treat their waste waters, water canals should treat uh, domestic waste waters, and then uh, we will get um, pure um, water resources. Now I would like to draw your attention to the screens. Uh, these are uh, videos or like uh, commercials, this, these are not um, uh, this is not advertising. Uh, this is a short video about our work. So we would like to invite you all um, uh, on Friday to Water Canal. If you have never been there, I would strongly recommend it because our main principle is education, um, informing. Uh, we um, do this. You, you see those uh, crayfish and uh, snails, they also uh, serve um, us. They work in uh, Water Canal and uh, it is an interactive museum, a water museum. And I know, I don't know, uh, in, in Russia there are no other museums like that. And I always um, mention uh, Prince Charles, for example, from Britain. He visited the Hermitage and our museum. So all of you are welcome. Uh, we would like to share with you the results of our work, and it is really very interesting. Thank you. And, um, and now, uh, uh, speaking about this principle that the polluters uh, pay, yeah, it, this uh, hasn't been invented by us. This is in line with the Helsinki Convention. And before that, in 2004 and in 1992, 
Yeah, that was uh, proclaimed uh, um, by the international um, community. And um, if we are going to introduce it, uh, yes, and if we do it, then we will um, drink uh, very uh, pure water. Uh, our next uh, speaker will be uh, Vladimir uh, Ivlev, um, who is um, a deputy uh, director of International Cooperation Department from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment. And he will be speaking about international uh, cooperation in um, using uh, transboundary uh, water um, resources. Thank you. My friends, because I'm sitting between friends uh, here, uh, it's a privilege and a pleasure to meet you here because we've spent quite some time with uh, Professor Polk <laughs> uh, uh, discussing some final points of uh, monitoring uh, procedures on the huge uh, infrastructural project uh, in the Baltics. And um, I really believe that uh, the political will of our countries uh, helped us greatly to find the solution uh, on a consensus basis, I would say. And it was a great job and we've done it. And uh, it was one of those days when we were really proud of what we accomplished. And uh, uh, met, uh, Mr. Hansen and we are meeting on a regular basis within the framework of uh, the Arctic Council. So it's a pleasure, Yaka, to meet you again. And uh, 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 dear colleagues, I thank you very much. I thanked the organizers and my great colleagues from uh, Finland for this opportunity to uh, take part in this very significant event. I would like to say that the Ministry um, of uh, Natural Resources uh, pays uh, great attention to uh, this um, aspect of cooperation and legal aspects of um, cooperation and actually all key um, the representatives of uh, this legal uh, department of the Ministry of Natural Resources of Russia, they are here. Uh, for example, this uh, head of the uh, water uh, regulation uh, department. Um, uh, so this is a division um, of the uh, water um, uh, department and Mr. Kanaiva and Mr. Kornienko, he's also here with us. He is responsible for all procedural aspects uh, within uh, uh, the ESPO convention and uh, issues related to it. What I would like to say, of course, there won't be any uh, presentation, like formal presentation, but we have prepared it. And uh, if uh, you are interested, uh, what we have been doing, and uh, you know all those correct and appropriate words, it is uh, all in the uh, presentation in the um, uh, paper uh, that we um, uh, submitted earlier. So you can ask the organizers or us. We can send it over to you if you need some clarification or comments or explanations, we can provide them here while we are uh, this forum or um, uh, by um, uh, electronic communication. Um, Mrs. Uh, Poca gave a very uh, interesting presentation. We are very well aware of what uh, you do in Finland in the water protection area. Uh, this year, 2014, apart uh, from being the year of the Gulf of Finland and the United uh, Nations uh, com uh, announced uh, this year the International Water Year. Uh, for us um, and our uh, Finnish colleagues, this is a great uh, e event because uh, this is exactly 50 years um, since we signed a historic um, agreement um, it is very important, and this uh, is a uh, transboundary water course agreement that was signed in uh, 1964. I don't remember the exact date. It was some um, time in September. Uh, so that was at the times of the Soviet Union. Apart from this agreement with uh, Finland, 
Uh, we have, um, apart from that first agreement, we have nine agreements with our neighbors. And what I would like to draw your attention to in this respect, and I'll uh, try to mention your, um, uh, to refer to your question as well, because oh, I will have uh, many more other questions as well. Okay. We, uh, dear colleagues and friends, we have uh, to um, uh, see everything uh, in the um, future. So there sh we should take a broader view, especially if we speak about transboundary water course. We cannot speak about um, uh, the short-run um, plans for a year or two. No, it is. it should be always um, a, a long-term perspective. And we should take into account factors that are not, as it looks, directly linked to the water resources. They might, might have cultural or political roots or just uh, some uh, human component in it. And all this is uh, quite a complicated mess and um, mixture of uh, factors. And uh, sometimes, um, really, it is very hard to find an objective uh, solution that will meet all uh, uh, parties and all stakeholders, and we um, cannot say, you know, there is a joke. Uh, how are we going to um, uh, divide it? Uh, uh, shall we do it like friends? No, we are not going to uh, share it like friends. Uh, no, let's have uh, let's divide it fifty fit to fifty. So in our um, area, uh, it um, uh, sometimes happens that uh, fifty uh, fifty principle will be fair, uh, but it's uh, not always um, like that. And it is my responsibility and our responsibility as a ministry to find some solutions uh, because if there's a will uh, and these uh, solutions will um, uh, meet um, and will be in line with uh, the wishes of uh, all the people who live in this region and um, answering your question uh, my um, deep understanding is that if uh, parties um, would like to reach an agreement, even if the matter is very complicated, we can always uh, come to an agreement. And um, there are numerous examples. We have uh, come to, uh, an agree to agreements with uh, the uh, China, um, uh, with China and with Kazakhstan. You know, there were very complicated issues. And uh, for a long time, there was no way out. But when there was a political will, then we reached um, uh, certain agreements and professionals um, were doing uh, their job and uh, some mechanisms were introduced. Yeah, of course, there are some gaps and um, uh, yes, there's always um, room for improvement, but we have the basis for it. Okay, and uh, speaking about some um, a principal um, aspects, our approach involves, let's take um, years 2007, 2008. So um, within the last eight, eight years, uh, a lot has changed in the area of regulation. In uh, I'm, I'm speaking about environment protection. All major strategic documents, uh, yeah, all uh, strategic documents have been uh, adopted uh, since uh, 2008. And this is the water strategy, environmental uh, strategy, and uh, so on and so forth. Okay, so about nine or ten documents. It was in these recent years that uh, for the first time the new Russia adopted and started to implement its federal targeted program on reforming the water management sector, the entire sector of Russia. I'm not going to re repeat myself here. The experts know very well how difficult it was. That exercise uh, involved input from all the line ministries because you know how it works in Russia. We have uh, regional subsidies. We have uh, certain lines of interaction with the private sector. So it was complicated. In 2012 and 2013, an enormous amount of work was uh, carried out uh, and uh, it is well documented uh, 
we have been able to completely turn the situation around in Russian environmental legislation. In terms of transboundary watercourse uh, cooperation, uh, there are nine international conventions uh, to which Russia is a party. In the number one is the famous Water Convention, the Ramsar Convention on uh, internationally significant uh, wetlands. Ludmila Kanaeva, by the way, knows very well about that convention and if she has the time she will certainly address Ramsar. So there have been a lot of changes. Nevertheless, perfection is not always the perfect answer. And if we ask ourselves candidly, honestly, have we taken care of everything? Can we say with 100% confidence uh, that we have the entire legal framework to enable us to comply with all the international standards and norms that Russia has supported as a party under international instruments? You know, rather than simply sharing a principle, in certain instances Russia said that yes, this is going to be ratified. It's going to be incorporated. Incorporated is the word here. So it's law now. And the answer to that candid question uh, from my perspective uh, as an executive official responsible for international partnerships, uh, cooperation with international organizations, drafting of international agreements and coordination of their implementation, as a public official, my answer is no. There is a number of serious legal loopholes still in existence. These are loopholes that need to be addressed. A number of bridges that need to be gapped, uh, ga <coughs> gaps that need to be bridged, and uh, a number of new notions have to be introduced into Russian legislation. I'm referring in the first place to the water code. Uh, it has been amended and modified several times. We're not saying that it is completely obsolete. It uh, has the potential of meeting modern challenges. However, there is still a number of uh, issues that need to be addressed through the water code. Let me give you a few examples here with the permission of the moderator. If you take the water code, it does not have uh, a provision defining transboundary water systems or transboundary water objects, as we say. And this would be very important for a country who is a member of the Water Convention, but we don't have the definition in our legal framework, in particular in the Water Code. Um, neither is there a, uh, a, a provision that will establish a separate legal regime for these transboundary water objects. Uh, together with my colleague from the Ministry of Construction. We have talked about that and Oksana, I have listened to your presentation with great interest. There is no provision that would uh, draw a dividing line between uh, um, the um, responsibilities and duties of uh, various regional bodies uh, f mm, that are responsible for the territory of this water course. Uh, um, how do they implement the polluter pay principle, pays principle uh, if there's no enabling provision? The polluter pay is a very important principle, but uh, uh, because we don't have this regulation, that's part of the reason why China is not willing at this time to accede to the Water Convention. This is not the only issue. There is a number of other loopholes and gaps uh, in the Water Code and in other federal laws. However, work is underway to address this. Let me tell you that I personally am very supportive of this effort. Uh, we um, in the International Department uh, uh, try to support our colleagues from the legal department in every way on these priorities. And right now we have very concrete plans in mind for
for working together with other federal executive agencies uh, in 2015-2016 until the end of this year in order to continue improving the legislation. We have a very clear plan to incorporate into Russian legislation provisions of the ESPO Convention and uh, Ms. Pocahannely has addressed this already. We need to introduce amendments under the ESPO Convention to our legislation this year only. We're talking about some 14 legislative initiatives. It is less uh, clear with the ORHAS Convention. Uh, we need to understand that Russia needs to amend about 30 federal laws uh, in order to comply with ORHAS, and that includes the building code of the Russian Federation. There's a lot to discuss with our colleagues from the construction ministry about that. Nevertheless, I'm very satisfied that uh, there has been a cardinal shift in Russian lawmaking over the past years. Today, Russian legislation enables us to meet our international commitments, and because I'm in the business of international affairs, uh, I can say that with confidence. Yes, indeed, there is still some room for improvement. Nevertheless, I believe that we are on the right track. I'm finished with this part. In conclusion, I would like to use this podium, so to speak, uh, in order to address uh, the topic more broadly, in order to mention some concerns that uh, international environmentalists now observe. This forum and this roundtable is a very uh, welcome event indeed. Uh, for many years we have participated in uh, the All-Russian Meeting of Legal Experts on Water Management Systems. Uh, the latest, uh, it was held every year in June in Sochi and the professor participated in it, as well as some other colleagues. Unfortunately, in this respect, we're very much behind our partners and colleagues. Um, there is a number of venues where improvements to the water legislation in Europe and around the world take place. We're aware of some of them. We participate in some of them. However, uh, it is only a small part of all the venues that we participate in. I'm sorry for trespassing on your time. In conclusion, I would like to say this. From where we stand, uh, uh, from the perspective of Russia's uh, participation in international conventions uh, on transboundary water co courses and international lake, uh, wetlands of international significance, and so on and so forth, we see a lot of work ahead. And there is a lot of work for our legal community as well. We need to take a comprehensive approach on how Russia is going to change its legal framework. In particular, um, uh, taking into account that uh, synergies are increasing between these conventions. Uh, take the chemical conventions, for instance, the three main chemical conventions, the Basel, uh, Rotterdam and uh, Stockholm conventions have now merged. And along the same line of logic, the water conventions are certainly going to, well, not really merge, but probably move towards each other uh, in future. How this is going to be codified internationally, we don't know. We know how this is happening in Europe already. We're yet to see how these uh, rapprochement processes are going to be uh, legally embedded in Russia and uh, in various jurisdictions. Perhaps this is not a question for me. Uh, our professors, our academia representatives and uh, legal practitioners are in a better position to say what shape these new instruments are going to take. We're very forward-looking these days, let me tell you, especially in the run-up uh, to the Seventh World Water Forum that will take place in 2015 in South Korea. More effort is now being put uh, into the question of uh, developing 
regulation that will enable a comprehensive approach to water supply and sanitation, monitoring, reuse, innovative use, uh, integrated use of water resources in urban and rural settings. Uh, in other words, it's all about a comprehensive approach. Uh, our colleague has already talked about it very eloquently. The legal thought is uh, very much f ahead, the legal thinking, but how is the, this is going to be applied in nation the national legislation um, is still unclear. And finally, a lot of progress has been achieved uh, to improve Russian water legislation. We know how much work is now underway in the European Union, uh, in, uh, especially in some of the champion countries such as Finland, Germany, France. Therefore, it would be very useful to learn about it, especially for the practitioners. Therefore, I would like to ask Alexander Volkov, uh, Gennady Volkov, uh, uh, would you find it possible to consider the question of uh, consolidating all these best practices um, in a collection of uh, articles uh, or in a publication of sorts, if not a hardcover, then possibly an electronic compilation of best practices, allowing for a comparison between Russian legislation, European Union legislation, um, by each of the key provisions. I'm sorry for being so hectic. In my intervention, I tried to highlight some of the most important concerns and priorities for my ministry. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Vladimir. Your message about the comprehensive approach uh, to international and national le le legislation uh, is very well taken. And let me stress once again, each of the speakers we have here is unique. Uh, Vladimir has experience of uh, not only working for the environmental ministry, but also for, uh, for the foreign ministry as part of his career. So he really has a very broad thinking. Um, that's what makes him unique alongside our other speakers. Vladimir, I don't want to let you go at this moment. See, the reason why I always go back to transboundary water courses is because this is not a theoretical issue. Take St. Petersburg, for example. We have uh, only one drinking water supply source, uh, the Neva River, but the Neva River flows out of Lake Ladoga, and Lake Ladoga in turn is part of a larger system that comprises Lake Onigo and Il Lake Ilman. Before the water reaches St. Petersburg, it will have incorporated waters from Karelia, from the manufacturing sites there, from Leningrad Oblast, which has the Slavanka, the Tosno, and a number of other heavily polluted rivers. Uh, there is a lot of agricultural pollution coming from cattle, uh, pasture lands, uh, a lot of chemical pollution, and this is what you get in the end in St. Petersburg. Of course, we do treat our water, but uh, it's transboundary sourced water. The principle of the convention is that everybody should take care of where they are, their part of the ecosystem. We already said that uh, waters do not recognize state borders, so everybody has to share the responsibility for a water system. This is why I'm so grateful to Vladimir for raising the topic of uh, transboundary water systems. I also know that in March, uh, uh, in, that in March, uh, uh, his department at the Ministry of the Environment came up with the initiative to, for Russia to host uh, the eighth World Water Forum, which is scheduled for 2018. 
Dmitry Kirillov made that statement. Uh, Russia is one of the three candidates to host the World Water Forum in 2018. I'm a little concerned about the time limits. Uh, the organizers asked us to start 10 minutes later. They were apprehensive that people may not be there. Now I'm going to give the floor to Mr. Jakob Hentinen. Vodokanal and Mr. Hentinen go a long way back, really. We are uh, friends. Mr. Hentinen has been extremely instrumental in getting Vodokanal projects underway when he worked for the Environment Ministry of Finland, when he also worked for the EBRG. Currently, he chairs uh, the North Dimension Environmental Partnership in the capacity of uh, the fund director. It was his uh, personal contribution that enabled so many water treatment projects in St. Petersburg. Please, Mr. Hentinen. Uh, I did not give the name of your support. International, of, uh, international cooperation in uh, environmental investment. Uh, I'm sure that everybody feels very strongly about this topic because we have law firms here and you're going to address a general issue. For the possibility to address this uh, forum and this round table on water. Indeed, uh, uh, I will not make, uh, like Vladislav was saying, that uh, uh, was saying that uh, we are not making presentations over here. And so I will also speak from my experience. And uh, uh, already with the preceding speakers, there are a few answers already to my questions which will be presented. Uh, yes, uh, I'm dealing with uh, international financing, and uh, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, been in St. Petersburg uh, or involved with St. Petersburg Water Canal for the last uh, 23 years and living in St. Petersburg since 2001. Uh, so I don't know whether I speak for Finns or Russians, but uh, anyway, I, I can assure and agree with uh, Mrs. Kassi that yes, there are plenty of friends in Water Canal. Uh, we have had uh, uh, good times, we have had serious moments, but anyway, always aiming at uh, result-oriented uh, decisions. So when we, when we uh, look back, we have had uh, successful attempts, successful solutions. We have uh, available challenges, which I, would, I will also describe a bit later. And the third, third one is uh, frustrations. Also, I uh, really look forward to uh, uh, getting uh, some ideas uh, from, from the distinguished panel uh, to sort out something of these uh, frustrations so that we don't have to go on pension with un uncompleted tasks. Uh, so when we, when we talk about uh, uh, solutions in the financing, financing sphere, uh, in 2001, uh, structure co which is called uh, environmental, Northern Dimension Environmental Partnership was created. And this indeed uh, is a partnership uh, including uh, international financing institutions, uh, uh, among them uh, European Bank for Reconstruction Development, Nordic Investment Bank, Nordic Environmental Finance Corporation, and European Investment Bank. Uh, that is one part. The other part is uh, national funding and uh, in international funding, uh, we include uh, federal budget funds, regional funds, as well as uh, funds from uh, enterprises like uh, Vodokanal St. Petersburg. And the third part is uh, the grant from NDP, which is uh, supportive to, uh, to a loan-based structures. So first, there will be a bankable uh, client, and uh, that will that is something on, on the challenging side. Uh, what are the benefits from uh, international approach when we, when we sought out, for example, investments in the wastewater treatment? Uh, we have uh, transparency for procurement. That's one thing. Uh, our experience shows that when uh, project uh, implementation unit has international uh, uh, experts, so the execution of project is uh, timely. Uh, 
Uh, when we talk about uh, the technical equipment, so we can guarantee the quality through the international tenders. Uh, and uh, we have a list of uh, successful projects uh, uh, in Saint with St. Petersburg Water Canal. There are already uh, five projects uh, uh, which all contribute to the same goal, full treatment of wastewater, uh, wastewater of the city. And on the screen you will see the figure 98.4, which was reached uh, last year. But it is not a one single uh, achievement. It is an achievement which has been accumulated during the last uh, uh, 15, 20 years. And uh, we can just, uh, I just take one figure, which is uh, the size of the uh, cost of the investment so far. It's very close to 1 billion euro, which has been used for improvement of uh, wastewaters in St. Petersburg. And when we talk about uh, transboundary waters, well, we are just not, uh, located at, uh, at the shores of uh, the Baltic Sea at the Gulf of Finland. And uh, 15 years ago, St. Petersburg was the biggest polluter. And uh, as we heard, the polluter has paid really well of the, for the investments and this is now treating the wastewaters and this part of uh, Gulf of Finland is already clearly free of blue uh, uh, green al algae. At this point, uh, yes, uh, well about the challenges, so uh, challenges which are kind of a bridge to the frustrations uh, come up first of all from uh, Smaller municipalities, for example, uh, uh, Russian Ministry of uh, Natural Resources and Ecology has developed a national implementation plan for the Baltic Sea Action Program, which uh, was prepared uh, and presented in 2010 at the ministerial, at the Helco ministerial meeting in Moscow. Unfortunately, the funds were withdrawn from that plan. And when we think about the smaller municipalities, especially uh, around the Baltic Sea, Leningrad Oblast, Pskov, Novgorod, Karelian Republic. Uh, so very little has been invested in the improvement of both drinking water services as well as wastewater treatment in these municipalities. So that is, that is a challenge which uh, we have to face and we are, we are from the international financing side looking forward to combine funding from, uh, from Russian uh, uh, national uh, programs to to get uh, projects going in uh, in an effective and uh, resu uh, resultative way. Uh, the other thing is, which was referred already, that uh, yes, polluter pays, but if polluter doesn't have money, so uh, then then there is a problem, and that comes down to the tarification. So the tariffs cannot are still by and large controlled and uh, they are not based on, uh, on the operational uh, factual situation in, in municipalities. So the smaller municipalities are lacking uh, resources for investments in this, in this sector. Sometimes there is no will, usually when there is a motivation, so we get something done in, in cooperation. That's a good example is, for example, Sosnovi Bor and uh, Gatsina in in the neighborhood. And then, uh, well, with my short presentation, I think uh, I will not end up with frustra frustrations, but uh, I can't help highlighting uh, the situation in Kaliningrad, uh, where the first uh, documents for construction of wastewater treatment plant in that beautiful city were drawn in 1976. Still today, uh, there is no wastewater treatment in uh, in a city of uh, 425,000 people, and uh, which is discharging every day 150,000 cubic meters of untreated wastewater. Uh, so my question, actually, to distinguished uh, panelists, would be that, uh, well, uh, nobody is uh, uh, having having uh, uh, un. I would say, how would I say it? Uh, inconvenient feelings in Kaliningrad, 
not in the oblast level, city level, uh, the least uh, direct worker now. And uh, notably, environmental charges from Vodokan and Kaliningrad are today zero. And as my colleague to the right referred that, well, when they will start treatment of wastewater, they have to pay a fee because they can't meet the uh, quality of the recipient water. So there is something which I'm very happy to hear that the uh, that, uh, uh, regulations are being mm -hmm. modified to, to respond to reality. And uh, I think that will, that will give us uh, also hope for further investments. But anyway, that is something which, uh, which is rather shameful at the moment. We are proceeding with our international and national uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Ministry of Finance from Moscow, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, from Moscow, is having close attention to Kaliningrad. And of course, we can always use uh, as a good example from St. Petersburg that when there, whenever there is a motivation, we can, we can uh, find ways uh, to finance these necessary tasks. And uh, if there is no feeling of responsibility, so then we are, we are in a in very difficult uh, situation. So that's, uh, that's uh, an issue which uh, I would like uh, uh, somehow to, to get uh, at least some support how to, how to, draw, how to get uh, these beautiful beaches in Kaliningrad a bit cleaner in uh, not in very long time from now. So uh, I will end up with, uh, with uh, thanks to Vodokanal, really. It is, it is such a task which was about, uh, when we started our cooperation with Vodokanal, it was difficult to imagine that we can reach. And, uh, and, uh, and the center, which uh, Ms. Cassie was pointed out, pointing out, is disseminating information about uh, good practices, developing the standards of uh, uh, of, of operational ta uh, staff as well as uh, management in this region, and I would say probably uh, throughout Russia, and that's uh, something which we can be very happy about. So international cooperation, I would say, is bringing transparency, is bringing technical uh, good solutions, and uh, we can look upon uh, further cooperation in this, in this uh, uh, field with Vodokan uh, and Petersburg. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hemtinen. Unfortunately, we have three speakers on my list, and I would like you to listen all of them. I have uh, Mr. Kasper Herler, who is a partner of a Finnish uh, Berenius group of companies. It is the Finnish part in this sense. Then we have Gennady Volkov, Professor uh, of Ecology and Land Law Department of the Faculty of Law of Moscow State University, as well as Lyudmila Kanaeva. We started listening to her. She has a very interesting presentation. She is head of Division of Water Legislation, Legal Department, and especially uh, protected areas of the Ministry of National Resources and the Environment of the Russian Federation. I have prepared questions for each of the speakers, but first I will probably give the floor to the next speaker and ask one question at the end if we have um, time for that. Mr. Kasper Heller will uh, talk about the uh, regulation and provision of clean water for industrial purposes. Mr. Uh, Heller is a partner with Berenius law firm. He used to work for the Ministry of the Environment of Finland. He is, holds a PhD in law and the floor is yours. To to address uh, certain uh, short themes for, for within this panel, uh, I think uh, kind of a general theme uh, which we, we are working to, towards here during the panel is that uh, the more history and the more advanced the legal system is, the, the more 
there's a shift from from politics to law, and I, I think in this panel we're 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 starting to reach that even more, more and more more the, the the more practical legal questions, and uh, and where where we are we're more touch, touching upon legal questions. The the, the environmental lawyers are are getting a, a stronger role, and and just as a way of background, how how things are in Finland. I I had a, a team of of, uh, of eight. Uh, specialized lawyers in, in environmental law, which which only practice environmental law within a fir law firm of, of of slightly over 100 lawyers. So so it, it's kind of possible to to make a living also just on on advising on on environmental law issues and that and uh, uh, sort of generally to set set the stage uh, more more generally on on uh, on. On main topics of, of regulating clean water and access to it, I think there's there's three three topics of which I, I'm going to touch upon. On the first one, the first one being uh, what kind of, of regulatory framework will ensure that the sources of clean water uh, will be effectively uh, protected and preserved. And the, the the second thing is is in in especially more arid locations, which which for for Russia, which is a very wide country, uh, can can be be uh, be the question. Uh, and 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 in places where there's a limited amount of, of clean water available, how will the right to clean water be distributed between different parties uh, and and competitive uses? Uh, in in countries like Finland, there's there's typically too much water, uh, in, 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 uh, and too too much rain, and so so it's more a question of what, what to do with the excess water. Whereas in, in many other jurisdictions, you you have to fight kind of over over the water. Uh, but I'm not going to address that to, to tomorrow uh, to, to the, today. And, and a third third issue, which we've already been touched in the, in the panel, is is how to to distribute this this clean clean water and how, how to collect the, the waste water. That's also a topic which I will not touch. Instead, I, I will concentrate on this first one. Uh, and and when, when we think about what, what would be an effective legal framework for, for water protection, there's a there's number of various regulatory alternatives. But I think two, two main things which we have to think about is, 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 is that surface water and groundwater are, are quite different and they have, uh, there's, there's different aspects into, into protection of those. For surface water bodies, it's, it's very much about controlling wastewater emissions uh, in order to achieve quality of, of the water, waters and, uh, and also to address certain topics regarding to Project water waterway projects, which which cause the structural contamination of, of the water bodies, whereas for for groundwater, which have not been touched up on so much today, uh, it's more about controlling uh, soil contamination or groundwater contamination for, from from uh, from uh, certain small uh, sources, or then from from for instance fertilizers from an ag agricultural. Uh, Impact. Well, when we when we go to to the more to the legal framework, uh, there's there's two concepts in the English language which are quite close to each other, but which are very different in background. One is effectivity, and the other one is cost efficiency. And those are very, even though they're they're they're, they're verbally quite close to each other, they're sort of by principle and by background very different. Uh, and, and when, we, when, we, when we speak about effectivity, the regulatory mean would be administrative control. So having civil servants, having the, the, the public, public bodies uh, addressing the issue of contamination through permits or through de detailed regulations, whereas cost efficiency relates more to economic regulatory instruments, where you, for instance, create a financial scheme which, as it's yeah, fr from by, by nature and, and by itself regulates and, and creates a, uh, an economic uh, area of operation which drives people to, to, to behave in a way which protects the environment. The first one, the administrative control approach, is more a continental approach, I think, of countries like many, many countries in Europe, whereas, whereas the economic regulation in, instrument 
approach is more an Anglo-American type of, of, of way and approach uh, to things. But it's, there's also relay, it, there's a difference to, to what you want to regulate. If we want to regulate clean air or, or, uh, or for instance, CO2 emissions, economic instruments are, are very easy to use because uh, the, 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 the impact is, is spread around. And, and uh, whereas, for instance, for water, it's, uh, we're, there's difficult to structure uh, frameworks where, for instance, you could freely pollute at one place if you sort of invest into, into, into protection somewhere else. There has to be a certain amount, uh, kind of a baseline of, of, of protection and, 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 uh, and, uh, and clean, cleaning uh, uh, technology all, uh, at all, all stages. Um, and the, so, so uh, and, and uh, with relation to economic regulatory instrument, one question is, of course, is sanction fees enough? I mean, is it an, an efficient regulatory instrument just to impose fees? Uh, uh, it, it can be an effective economic instrument if the fee levels are very, very high, because then there's a preven preventory mechanism that, that, that keeps companies and operators from polluting. It's, it's, more, it's, more, uh, it's more, more cost efficient to invest into, into, protector, uh, uh, into um, environmental technology than to pay those fees. But if the fee levels are too high, then there's a, uh, an immediate economic driver to pollute because it's, hard, it's cheaper to pollute than to, 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 to invest. Uh, Going ahead uh, in, uh, with, with various alternatives um, um, uh, of, of structuring a legal framework, one, one question is in more detail how to, how to regulate it. Um, should you use, for instance, look at the recipient water body uh, and a more general approach, or, or should you regulate plants specifically? Uh, or, or some sort of a, of a combination of, of both. Uh, and uh, I think currently in the EU uh, scheme and in the EU countries, you use, use the approach of both. You both have uh, uh, the water framework directive-based approach where you, you set certain quality standards for, for larger uh, water bodies, but then on the other hand, you have the industrial emissions directive which regulates uh, uh, an operator specific approach on on uh, on uh, each and every facility and, and regulate uh, emissions from those uh, another another approach and, and a choice which which a, a regulator has to has to make is whether to use very general emission guidelines, so to say that, that from a certain type of industry there's a certain milligram per liter uh, emission level which, which applies, or whether to look in each and every specific case on, on, the, on, the, on the specific operation. And, uh, and uh, that combines to, which uh, Ms. Ms. Hannele Pokkahil also re referred to, the best available techniques. What's the best reasonably affordable environmental protection technique available on the market, setting that as a threshold. So you, at least you have to have that. And that sets kind of the, the, the limit values for your operations. Uh, uh, so uh, and I think this has much to do with what type of operations you regulate. If you're talking about very, very similar operations like agriculture, uh, gas stations, uh, aggregate production, or power stations, which are very similar in their emissions, it, it's, it's, it's a very effi efficient way and, and cost-efficient way of, of having the more general approach. Each and every type of uh, so sort of similar set of, of uh, emission levels for each and every operation. But if you have, for instance, more complex uh, process industry, uh, you would typically 
want to have a more site-specific approach on the very specific emissions of, of that facility. The challenge with that is, of course, that it demands a tremendous amount of, of regulatory authority resources. And, and that's kind of the challenge. Uh, you can make up a state-of-the-art legal framework by legislation, but in order to deliver environmental protection results, uh, you have to enforce and put that into place with, with, a, with a working administrative um, body. And, and I think that relates quite a lot to the, regular, uh, to the, to the governance culture. Uh, to have, you, you need to have that in order to get that to work. And that relates both to the governmental part, but also to the pr private actors. There needs to be awareness that was also mentioned here earlier on. There needs to be enough of awareness and, and, and ability to, to put that into place. Um, so, uh, and then I, I think I, since we, we, are, we have a limited amount of time, I, 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 I think I, I will conclude just with, with a couple of... We have no time at all, actually. <laughs> of, uh, ...of ideas uh, which you, in, in, in private practice, touch upon uh, kind of challenges of the theme of environmental law is not only law, but it's, it's also science and technology combined with law. And, and as uh, the ones who are both us who are lawyers need to, to have an openness to understand those, those topics. So for instance, uh, lawyers typically tend to think that science is very exact. Uh, it's, that it's, it's, uh, it's a very numerical and fairly easy, uh, easy process and easy results. And we, so, so it's important to understand how science works. For instance, I, I take an example. Uh, all scientific, uh, for instance, uh, uh, environmental testing is related to uh, measuring uncertainty. And typically, for water samples, that can be 30%. So, so a lawyer can easily think that uh, if the limit value would be 100, 100.1 would be an excess, uh, a direct excess of that. But if you have a measuring uncertainty of 130, your tests can show you 130, and you're still de facto uh, with, with, within 100. So just as a, as a kind of very uh, simplified example, uh, another one relates to to that in many scientific methods, you take a security margin already in, in the, in the science, scientific testing. And, and if you put in a, another margin in the legal framework, then you have kind of a double security margin. Well, for some, in, in some businesses, that can be a good thing, of course, if, if, uh, uh, if the risks are very, very, very large. But, but you need to at least understand uh, what you're regulating and with what, what instruments. But maybe with, with these words, uh, if, if there's, there's questions, I can, I can come up with, uh, with, with, with additional comments. But, uh, but as a starter, I, I may, may, may end with this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Heller. We have that time. Hmm. Yes, we are sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Herler. Yes, we do have questions. Yeah, let's now move on. And uh, if there are additional questions, then we can um, forward them to you by email. Uh, if you allow me, I'm, I would like to express my gratitude to all of you who are um, here with us. I would like to give the floor to uh, Gennady Volkov, uh, Ludmila Anatoly. Tolivna, uh, can I, I, I will also give um, a chance for you to speak. So, but now I would like to give the floor to Gennady Volkov, professor of the uh, environmental. 
um, aspects uh, from the uh, Moscow University. He took part in development of the water code and the land code, and he is deputy chief editor environmental law. And I would like to emphasize all this because I always try to demonstrate that when we uh, were asking um, our participants uh, to speak here, we were trying to select the most interesting uh, speakers from the academic and practical points of view. So, Mr. Volko, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Moderator. I would like to thank the organizers of this uh, forum uh, for organizing this environmental session. I would like to draw your attention to the uh, issues of uh, sanitary uh, zones, um, sanitary protection zones, and I will try to uh, give a definition. No one um, is surprised uh, to learn that this uh, problem appeared from the very beginning. So when um, some towns and villages um, uh, were appearing, and of course, it became a problem, a real problem, uh, when uh, these villages um, were developing and became big towns. In this uh, area, uh, hasty um, steps uh, do not always lead to good results. And this is especially true about protecting drinking water sources. What is important here? We see that there's a certain uncertainty uh, among different norms of protecting uh, drinking water sources. First of all, there is um, so many normative acts, and some of them are, uh, have been effective since the Soviet Union times. So there's no unified practice. And um, there were, uh, there, there's even a decree um, from dating back to 1937, and then uh, 1941, and 1971, and uh, courts cannot take a, a decision in a unified matter. And those uh, older uh, historical decrees, they took uh, different um, definitions and positions in terms of water um, uh, protecting sanitary zones. Another thing is how do we define the boundaries of the second belt of uh, this uh, sanitary zone? As for the first belt around water resources, uh, here everything is more or less clear. But the second uh, belt, sometimes it is different depending on the angle of the relief and um, so on and so forth. How do we determine the top um, uh, boundary of uh, this uh, norm? In the sanitary uh, norms, um, uh, they say that there should be a test that these um, discharges shouldn't reach water sources um, for at least five days. So, in each specific case, uh, when um, we um, uh, 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 when there is a dispute whether a certain property is in the second uh, in the second belt of this uh, sanitary protection zone, and uh, this is sometimes um, in relation to tributaries, um, and uh, such uh, streams uh, may be very numerous, and uh, they are uh, not um, part of the. Um, uh, state uh, registry. Another um, significant aspect, it is important to um, develop a um, uh, plan of these uh, sanitary zones and very many uh, different entities and agencies are involved in this work. These are various uh, sanitary and epidemiological oversight um, uh, bodies, um, then um, territorial um, uh, bodies um, of the federal Water Resources Agency, then it is Rosprirod Nadzor, and um, also local municipalities that are also responsible for the quality of water, and uh, water canals um, that are responsible for supplying fresh water, and they are uh, supposed to determine those sanitary zones, and uh, we'll all know that seven um, cooks spoil the broth. Uh, so what about um, the uh, boundaries, and this is very important in terms of trading uh, land 
land plots. Uh, there were changes introduced into the land code, and those um, land plots that are within the first belt and the second belt, um, there are no problems with the first belt, as I uh, mentioned previously, but w with the second belt of sanitary zones, this is very um, uh, difficult to determine. But this uh, limits uh, limits um, trading of these land plots. It means that these land plots can be privatized, and there are so many lawsuits because so many owners, they try to privatize, but there are no specific boundaries of the sanitary zones. So all this leads to legal uncertainty, and we see that there are more and more such cases and lawsuits. And, um, of course, not only uh, property owners are interested uh, in finding a solution. Of course, local uh, territorial bodies, uh, they um, are interested in this because uh, they uh, would like maybe to sell uh, or provide some land plots for development. But, they, again, they are not quite sure whether uh, these land plots are uh, part of the second belt of the sanitary zone. So, um, on the one hand, this area should be developed, but on the other hand, uh, there's all this uh, legal uncertainty. All this um, demonstrates that uh, a lot of uh, land plots, and this includes, uh, this covers um, big um, cities, and in the Moscow um, region, uh, the, there are towns like Zelenograd, Mozhaisk. Actually, the whole uh, area of these uh, towns is a part of the zones, and it is not possible to develop these towns. And this leads to another problem. Two-thirds of the land plots were privatized before 2007, and the remaining uh, plots, if you go around uh, a lake or um, a river, uh, we see a very um, um, dramatic um, a picture. We can see uh, that there are um, a good um, solid um, buildings and homes with uh, um, uh, all modern um, utilities and so on, and this is uh, usually privatized um, land plots and uh, homes, but um, on uh, those uh, land plots which were not privatized, uh, they sim there's no um, sewer um, collection system, and they simply discharge the uh, wastewater into the streams or lakes or rivers. And this is extremely important, and we need to to sort it out because um, and now, actually, all this uncertainty um, leads not to protection, but actually we uh, see some negative results. So the, we should uh, streamline uh, regulation in the area of uh, sanitary uh, protection zones. And also, we need to ensure um, a more efficient oversight and uh, control over this. And of course, um, it is uh, necessary uh, to find clear justification of all these limitations and constraints. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to speak more, but I'm aware of the time and I cannot cover this topic in greater detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gennady Alexandrovich. Before I give the floor to um, Ludmila Kanaeva, I would like to shake up the audience uh, to wake you up um, before the last um, speech. I uh, prepared this question um, to Mr. Ivlev, uh, but it is addressed to everyone. Uh, my um, initial uh, impulse was uh, that we are speaking about global uh, problems. Maybe uh, it is enough uh, if um, um, every state um, gives a part uh, of its uh, sovereignty to some agency or body that will be dealing with water resources globally. What do you think? Will it enable us to solve this problem when we have some common an international um, body uh, with uh, some um, mandatory um, decisions and uh, actions? 
You know, um, speaking honestly, I doubt that existence of such a, a body will help us to um, reach all these solutions. No, I believe we can use the existing bodies and they could work more efficiently. Thank you very much. And Mr. Hentonin, please. Uh, maybe Mr. Ivlev. Thank you. I will uh, say very briefly. Uh, it's impossible to say just yes or no. Now, uh, there is a such uh, a body uh, within the United Nations. It is water pro U UN Water Program. The um, question about uh, establishing a global water agency like Rosvod Resources. This is a similar structure, but in Russia. Yes, it, is, it has been on the agenda, and it has been discussed. And at the last um, uh, conference of the uh, Transboundary Water Course Convention, yeah, we discussed uh, this uh, very seriously. And what um, you um, said, yeah, and those arguments, uh, they were very convincing, but there's no uh, unified um, opinion about this. And now I would be very diplomatic um, about uh, this. Yes, this uh, question has been around and uh, what um, we saw uh, in the Museum of Water Canal when you see the whole um, globe and you see, okay, this is um, the ocean water and uh, this is um, uh, the sh uh, share of the drinking water and when you see the difference and everybody has been um, speaking within the uh, G8 uh, discussions and wider international forums and uh, Rio plus 20 um, also discussed it. Water um, uh, provision uh, problems and uh, everything related to this and uh, food uh, food supply and energy supply to the population. All uh, these uh, problems uh, will uh, become more complex and uh, no one can predict what we are going to face in 20 years. So in relation to that, I believe some global regulatory mechanisms will be introduced. Probably there might be conventions that will um, be more more um, stringent and uh, global uh, because uh, this convention on uh, transboundary uh, water course uh, it is only within uh, the United Nations and it is just uh, uh, one um, region. And a lot has been done in this respect. If you don't remember, I would like to remind you, last year in Russia, we ratified the amendment to the convention that allows this convention to become global and any country can join it. Any country member of the United Nations can uh, join it. So this supports my um, idea that some uh, regulatory mechanisms will be introduced but uh, we will see what form what form um, these agencies will take yes i was absolutely right when i prepared this question for you i, I believe you wanted to uh, um, corner me with this difficult question okay yeah maybe um, our other speakers uh, uh, maybe mrs poker can say something in relation to that no new bodies. Uh, no, uh, yes, Mrs. Chair, no new bodies. No new bodies. We have United Nations, and, and as, as uh, uh, it was already mentioned, the water program under the framework at UN. And then we have this uh, uh, work with, with what we have, especially in Finland, worked uh, towards international agreement on transboundary water bodies, which is now going forward um, not so much not so much uh, uh, no binding documents i i have a feeling that we need something which really push forward because this water uh, problem is so so global but uh, the main question is as we always talk also in the framework of climate policy what is the, how powerful the united nations is there are sitting all countries we need more actions in the framework at UN. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Ah, I would like to continue in the same vein to support my colleagues who intervened earlier. I believe that the mechanisms, the bodies that uh, can potentially effectively address the protection and the management of water resources are already in place. What needs to be done is to create more engagement with these groups and commissions. Uh, we need to engage stakeholders by watersheds, by catchment areas, so that we can cover all the regions, uh, all the rivers and seas with this work. I think uh, to have a unified global body is uh, an unrealizable dream, uh, because uh, within that body, every body will be protecting the interests of their countries. And it would be difficult to achieve a consensus within that body, because there are so many different countries and conflicting opinions. I think uh, the basins uh, are, are the entities, so to speak, that can address this. Um, yeah, well, perhaps soft legislation is not working. Perhaps we need uh, something more mandatory. Uh, because we've had recommendations, we've had the soft international law, but uh, they remain recommendations without implementation. But the international law devolves uh, these matters on the international level. The international legislation can be much more strict, much more mandatory than uh, the soft international law. It all depends on the country's political will. No international body can compel them to do it. And as uh, Mr. Ivlev already said, it all depends on how much countries can achieve a consensus. It's up to the politicians to forge an agreement. I think it happens on all levels. For instance, take the NIVA example. If all the stakeholders agree, all the agents, the NIVA will be clean. And now over to you, Mr. Volkov. Dear colleagues, I would like to share with you some of the thoughts that I have uh, regarding how international, global, environmental and water problems can be addressed. I think you all agree that uh, it's not advisable to look for an extreme solution. The golden middle ground needs to be sought. Therefore, I think we should be looking in the first place uh, uh, for a common platform to address these environmental issues. This is not to say, however, that uh, in some situations we should not act uh, more actively, that we should not intervene to counter certain issues, uh, to turn the situation around in circumstances where human life is uh, in danger or certain species are uh, gravely jeopardized. Uh, take genocide, for instance. Genocide is a criminally punishable crime. I believe that the international hu environmental law is moving in that direction. Thank you very much for a very academic position on this, Mr. Hirler. think global, act local, and I think this, this also fits in, in this topic. Uh, uh, the, the sources of contamination are, are local or regional, and, and they need to be managed. Uh, the, 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 the end of pipe is there, and that has to be regulated. If you have, have several layers of regulation, you, 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 you get a lot of, of, uh, of additional relations to regulate. Uh, there's an example, uh, the border, uh, border Convention of, of water, water Protection between Finland and Sweden uh, uh, previously had a, a separate body to address this uh, 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 cross-border water protection issues, but that has now been abolished, and the, the Convention provides the material input uh, but 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 it's handled by the, the the regional authorities of both Finland and Sweden. So so I think at least 
there we have a very 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 local example of where 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 this more regional approach has been been addressed. Thank you very much. Спасибо большое. Thank you very much. And before I give the floor to Ludmila Kanaeva, her last presentation today is going to deal with uh, uh, shore line protected areas. Uh, before I turn it over to her, I would like to thank the um, interpreters, the, opera, the cameraman and the sound engineers who have been wor working very well since early in the morning. Please, Ms. Kanaeva, over to you. All right. Thank you very much. I'm not going to make a formal presentation. The text uh, of the formal report uh, was sent to the organizers. I'm going to show you there are 24 slides involved. Uh, there are three parts of it. Uh, the first one uh, has to do with water protection areas, uh, shoreline, uh, uh, belts uh, and uh, water bodies. Uh, this is where I talk about uh, various pieces of legislation that were developed and then um, adopted in uh, 2013. One of them is Federal Law 2, uh, 282 that uh, imposes additional restrictions on uh, various economic activities in designated water areas and protected shorelines. It imposes additional liability also. The Code of Administrative uh, uh, Offenses now uh, also has a an additional provision that reinforces uh, liability for obstructing access to a water body or to a protected shoreline belt, the public access uh, uh, shoreline belt. Then there is also Law 411. The land code pursuant to that law now contains a provision on access uh, to a water body that can be invoked as uh, a, a, a servitude. Uh, Right, uh, in other words, uh, mm, as grounds for using a land plot. So, access to water bodies has been strengthened. The Code of Administrative Offenses now also includes uh, liability associated with obstructing that access right. Uh, mm, I talk about this in my presentation. It's now part of our legislation. I'm not going to go into the particular penalties imposed on individuals and legal entities, as well as public on public officials. And then there was another law, 275, uh, that increases liability for violations, uh, or rather for, for violations uh, uh, associated with the use of water systems uh, uh, for unauthorized uh, occupation of a water system. The penalties have, incre have been increased uh, approximately tenfold. Uh, so this was the first my, my presentation that deals with uh, designated water areas, protected areas. The second part deals with what Mr. Ivlyev talked about, the legal regime for wetlands of international significance. Um, uh, that water wetlands that uh, are an important habitat for waterfowl. Um, uh, the Soviet Union joined Ramsar in 1972. Nevertheless, uh, Russian legislation only contains one document, uh, a 1995 uh, government resolution that obliges uh, regional executive authorities to establish a provision on international significant uh, wetlands harboring waterfowl um, uh, those provisions were incorporated into the 1995 Water Code. Um, wetlands uh, were considered under that provision as uh, special significance water objects uh, uh, that increased their level of protection. But uh, as we know, the 1995 Water Code. Uh, is no longer valid since 2007. We now have the 2006 Water Code that uh, superseded it. The new Water Code does not have the definition of wetlands. It does not contain any specific provisions regarding a legal regulation regime for these types of water systems. As a result, in practice, wetlands are very often 
unprotected. Uh, they can be rented, they can be sold out to individuals as well as to businesses. When courts are approached, the prosecutor's office will usually take this side of the defense, or rather as the claimant. Uh, however, very often the uh, courts uh, will not support the prosecutor's office position because uh, the wetlands uh, do not have uh, a clearly defined status under current Russian legislation. And this again points to the fact that Russian legislation still have a lot of gaps def despite the ratification. Um, um, because Ramsar does not have uh, direct application provisions uh, in it uh, that would preclude these uh, wetlands from being sold or circulated otherwise, uh, uh, they are unprotected because Russia does not have specific concrete domestic legislation governing this. As a representative of the environment, uh, which is uh, the competent body for the implementation of the Convention. I would like to support publicly the idea of coordinating our efforts uh, towards bridging that gap. We need a definition of wetlands as specially designated and protected water systems. Uh, we need a leg legal regulation regime. We need limited circulation for these areas. Uh, wetlands ideally should be viewed as uh, specially protected natural areas. Uh, they should have that effort in order to enable an international standard of protection for them. This was the second part of my presentation. Let me now jump to the third part. The third part uh, uh, is really a success story that I can safely brag about. Um, I'm talking about the implementation of international standards uh, in the field of uh, protection, management, uh, and conservation of maritime environments. Uh, in 2002, the President uh, of Russia um, issued a directive to implement uh, maritime protection standards uh, that are recognized uh, internationally with regard to the use of subsoil resources, uh, extraction and transportation of oil, the inclusion of ice, protection, ice habitat protection standards into these activities, and uh, to also provide uh, for sufficient financial uh, support of these activities from the operators. Uh, Work has been in process since then. No. The most important law in this regard has been a law that took a long time for the Ministry of the Environment to develop. Uh, the development process for that law started in 2009. In 2010, uh, the law uh, took shape. Uh, at the end of 2012, it was adopted. Uh, it's the law on amending two Russian laws. One on, is on the Russian continental uh, shelf and the other on the Russian territorial waters. These laws uh, have introduced a number of important provisions uh, under which uh, the operator is uh, required to have uh, a, an oil spill prevention plan. The oil spill prevention plan has to be approved by the State uh, Environmental Expert Committee. The operator should have enough financial capacity and enough assets of to have these measures in place. There is uh, a list of specific requirements uh, as to what is required. The Ministry of Emergency Situations has uh, developed a list of assets for both maritime and onshore projects. The, the Environmental Ministry has uh, developed an, an assessment process uh, uh, to determine the financial um, capacity required for these measures, and that includes uh, uh, banking a guarantee, a bank guarantee, an investment fund, uh, and uh, a compensation scheme. Of course, this uh, will need to be improved. In order to implement the law, a number of bylaws will have to be adopted as well. As I said already, a number of acts have already been uh, developed and are currently um, going through the ministries. Uh, but I think uh, all these different efforts uh, 
uh, point to the fact that Russia is now actively reforming its legislation. There is a lot of uh, coordination between various executive authority, and that includes line ministers such as the Ministry of Transport, the Energy Ministry, the Emergency Situation Ministry, the Environmental Ministry, the Transport Ministry. Uh, uh, in 2010, quite a long time ago, presented uh, two draft uh, laws to the environmental ministry. These bills uh, uh, could have addressed a number of important issues regarding maritime environment protection. One had to do with the liability of uh, shipping companies and the other um, dealt with uh, the compensation fund uh, for transportation damage. That law uh, that I mentioned before does not address transportation. The Ministry of Transportation have their own framework, uh, uh, but this law, 287, two only addresses subsoil resources extraction issues. Another success story, uh, law 287 on amendments to uh, the law on uh, internal maritime um, uh, marine areas uh, and the Russian uh, areas uh, that e applies the London Convention provisions uh, prohibiting pollution of the marine environment by discharge of pollutants uh, um, by extending those provisions to soil that is dredged during dredging operations. Uh, according to that uh, the dredged bottom soil is not considered to be a waste. Discharge of uh, that material can be dumped, uh, provided that uh, there is an, an environment ministry um, uh, authorization. The authorization is uh, obtained following series of tests. Um, if uh, the subsoil, if, if the bed, seabed material contains uh, any prohibited items, uh, then it cannot be dumped into the sea. There have been a lot of uh, efforts uh, on the part of the President of others uh, uh, to create a process for using that uh, uh, seabed material um, so that can be used in uh, response measures to emergency situations. Well, I think I've come to the end of my presentation. Uh, Russia has made a lot uh, in this, has achieved a lot in this field. The five uh, new laws have been adopted. There is also a number of bills uh, that uh, are nearing second reading. Uh, currently, 20th of June, uh, the Russian Parliament will uh, take the second and third reading of two bills. Uh, one is to, uh, of them is to amend uh, the law on the Baikal natural territory. You may have heard that this is a law with a long history. It all started in 2010. It passed first hearing in 2011. Uh, then there was a lengthy discussion on uh, what uh, particular amendments need to be introduced in the, the existing legislation before the second hearing commenced. Uh, uh, on, in the law on Baikal, there is a provision that says that the water protection area is determined by the law on Baikal. However, the law on Baikal is silent on um, demarcation criteria for these zones. So now we have a bill where it is determined that the uh, protection, uh, water protection zone and uh, the uh, fishing protecting zone will be uh, determined by some normative act. Probably this will be an order. And uh, also uh, it includes that any um, activities in the Baikal area uh, should um, be evaluated and only if there is a positive um, a report from the environmental mental inspection only uh, after that these activities will be possible and uh, secondly uh, the, l the law draft law on uh, best available technology um, again uh, this Friday on the 20th of June uh, we all hope that this 
law will be adopted. I'm not going to speak about it because everyone knows about it. Uh, there are lists of uh, best available practices, and uh, they um, they also uh, there are also benefits and various incentives uh, for um, entities uh, who are responsible for various activities and um, also water treatment uh, work and so on. So that's it. Thank you very much. I try to be very brief. Thank you. Uh, before we finish, I would like to ask, maybe there are questions from the audience. Speak to the microphone, please. А вы микрофон, пожалуйста, иначе не, не переведут, не переведут. I have um, a, a question. Going back uh, to sanctions for environmental crimes, I should say that in our um, uh, criminal code uh, there is liability for uh, such. The, the two, uh, actually, the whole article is devoted to environmental crimes, and also Article to, um, 150 it is for water pollution. And I agree with um, the speaker but there are also questions. Uh, for example, go back to uh, paper. What if you um, uh, drop you know, a piece of paper into a lake? It uh, won't um, pollute it. Okay, what about minimal sanctions? What are minimal? I would like to ask you about the Finnish um, laws. Uh, what is the minimum penalty for water pollution? And do you have, do you have any um, articles? I'm a deputy of the uh, State Duma. Um, Mr. Sukharev, so what is the minimum penalty for water pollution in Finland? Thank you for the, for the question. Uh, in the Finnish system, uh, there are there are all, there are possibility to extend very severe uh, penalties for for environmental criminal sanctions, and uh, uh, I think up to six years of, of imprisonment for in, in, in very aggravated cases, whereas the, the in, and in those cases, uh, in aggravated cases, the, the minimum penalty would be four months of, of imprisonment. But, but what is, what is uh, more, maybe more important in terms of, of, uh, of a preventive effect is, is the, the fact that also legal persons have a criminal liability in the Finnish system. So, so there's a possibility for, a, for a, I think, 850,000 euro fine, uh, corporate fine for, for, the, for the companies. And, and maybe, maybe even, even a worse sanction is the fact that the whole, the whole uh, uh, profit which has been made, made by the, the, the criminal behavior can be confiscated. So, uh, so, uh, but, but uh, just, just very, very briefly, the, the, the criminal instruments are not the main driver in the, in the Finnish system. The whole Finnish environmental protection system is based on a pre sort of a, a, a preventive and a, a kind of a, a pre pre-assessment and pre-control. So there's a permit application, there's a robust hearing, and, and there's a, a very, very intense set of, of, uh, of uh, permit conditions. So for instance, for larger mining operations, there can easily be a hundred different permit conditions, which very detailedly set the, the limits for, for operation. And, and for that kind of operations, there might be an, an enforcement authority visiting the mine every, every week in order to ensure compliance. So, so that is the, the main point of view in, in the Finnish system in order to ensure environmental compliance. I would like to ask Mrs. Pokka to answer the same question. Yes, I, I could a uh, little continue what what uh, my colleague already already told. So the Finnish uh, 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 legislative system is based on preventive uh, preventive action. So the permit procedure is very important. But also um, um, all. Um, good environmental reputation is very important to companies. So they do not 
want to do anything which could make some harms to their environmental uh, reputation because it is a, a, a central part of their competitiveness. And uh, that's the reason that we very seldom see uh, situations that, that it has really happened some, some problems. But as I mentioned in my presentation earlier, um, we have had some, uh, some problems with our new uh, mining companies, which has uh, taken in use uh, a new technology and all impacts has not been seen in this preventive session. And we have had done uh, quite a lot of homework also in, in this uh, authority site that everything is in good, 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 good order. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, did you finish? Mm -hmm. I would like to add, if you allow me, when I was uh, listening to it, you know, this is what I have been trying to say for uh, these two hours. I'm a, um, a practicing um, a lawyer uh, of Water Canal, and we um, participate as a third uh, parties um, and uh, various lawsuits. It is administrative uh, violation of the use of water protecting um, the facilities and you know the maximum penalty is 20,000 rubles is it is 500 uh, euros this is nothing and um, they are afraid uh, only um, uh, one more stronger penalty where they can be detained or arrested for 90 days so I believe we should have either um, bigger uh, fines penalties or we uh, should have a more stringent um, control uh, over all these um, water wastewater discharges because otherwise we won't be able to get out of this vicious circle because we would like to drink uh, live uh, fresh water from the river but not uh, the water which is prepared by water canal of course we uh, prepare very good uh, pure water but this is not um, water coming from the river so I believe something uh, needs to be done and what else is um, quite illustrative when um, in those lawsuits if there are legal um, entities uh, that are branches of some international companies uh, they try to resolve these uh, disputes um, and they are ready to sign any agreements because they don't want uh, to be uh, taken to court because yes it is bad for their reputation and our companies they don't care because it is just 500 euros fine and that's it um, you know, we met in uh, Sochi, there was an all-Russia meeting called Water of Russia. It was a conference and we um, spoke there. There was a minister of environment uh, from the Volgograd region, from the Volga uh, river. And uh, uh, can you imagine, they um, uh, get uh, everything which um, gets into, which is uh, discharged into the Volga uh, because uh, they are towards the mouth of, of the river. And, uh, can you imagine what, uh, why they are responsible for that? Yes, we have uh, so uh, little time. You know, we could have spent a whole day discussing water. Yes, enterprises, yeah, they are scared um, of uh, sanctions um, of those uh, 90 days, yeah, when they can be arrested or the all, all operation can be stopped for 90 days. Yeah, this is what I said. A new um, law. Uh, um, there will be some new uh, measures. Uh, the liability, you know, the penalty is not so big. It is about the same. Uh, but also, the whole operation can be stopped. So this is a new 
a measure and uh, legal entities they also have this uh, corporate uh, liability yeah, and um, uh, directors and uh, people responsible can be arrested for 90 days so we are moving uh, towards making uh, all um, uh, this more stringent thank you very much I, I have another question what um, do you think about those arguments that industrial enterprises have that it is important to protect business from all these inspections and uh, uh, we should uh, visit them only once in three years uh, for example when we inspect uh, the environmental area this is what I started with I um, um, maybe uh, wasn't very uh, clear about all these uh, things and I'd like to say again uh, you know we uh, should reach a balance of these interests you know protecting their environment and protecting the interests of the industry we are not going to live in prehistoric times but um, we cannot make only industry responsible um, a member from the construction ministry um, spoke you know and after this water code and water strategy um, okay everything is clear but this article about um, protection of environment you know uh, all these amendments haven't been um, adopted yeah because the industrial lobby is stronger here but we all are absolutely sure what should be done but uh, they don't uh, allow us to do it maybe it's wrong to mention this here maybe it's not the right forum for that yes if you allow me, uh, I'm not uh, quite um, uh, strong in internal legislation, but I know international experience very well. In Switzerland, for example, okay, we um, do have uh, limitations. Uh, for example, okay, there are, um, there's a permit to have some uh, local water treatment facilities. And in Switzerland, you know, they build right on the shore of uh, some uh, 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 homes. They are built right on the uh, shore and uh, how do they get uh, permits I um, spoke um, with them and I asked uh, how do you get a permit from municipality and how long does it take for them to do um, so how do they uh, allow to build such a project with this uh, localized water treatment and the mayor said we don't have any limitations or constraints uh, I said no way how uh, can you do that because um, we um, they should um, give a response within 30 days this uh, term is uh, stated no they don't have any term so they um, will be um, working out this uh, permit for two years so until you follow all the requirements then um, only then they can give you this permit so I believe um, the regulator should um, introduce uh, certain mechanisms and uh, we see that there is um, uh, this uh, practice uh, in other countries and uh, you know in a municipality in that village or maybe it is a town in Switzerland so they will ensure the owner the developer whether it is a legal entity or an individual uh, to follow all the rules and norms and they can consider this application for a construction permit for a two uh, for two years and um, there's no uh, basis for um, uh, taking this to court so so they, um, people cannot uh, sue officials uh, for all this red tape and uh, lengthy consideration of their applications. Now they say when you uh, follow all the rules, then you will get a permit and there are no lawsuits. It's not only me who um, uh, knows about it. We were there with a colleague of mine, and uh, they said, you yeah, know, no lawsuits, no, everything is in line with the order. C uh, can I add something? There is one more problem. And um, yes, this is what I uh, wanted uh, to see. I wanted these issues to be raised. I uh, do realize that 
it is important. Yeah, one more problem is important is that all these controlling uh, bodies and uh, Rosprodnadzor, they should um, inform uh, companies uh, two uh, days before the inspection. Yes, usually um, they use these uh, two days in order to stop any um, uh, discharging of uh, contaminated water. And uh, next time, maybe these inspectors, they come if there's a complaint or something. Yeah, so our hands are tied up and the controlling bodies, knowing about um, these violations, they cannot um, punish these um, companies. So we have to uh, deal with it as well. We need to enhance uh, legislation and uh, law enforcement in this area. Yeah. Uh, German Vladimirovich, probably when you asked this question, you knew the answer. Yeah, could you follow this discussion? Could you add something? Maybe you have a comment. I wanted to say the following. We have the Constitution, thank God, and it's not bad at all. And also, also right to, uh, to um, life and uh, protected uh, life and here private law is in conflict with public law yeah this is international uh, standard uh, that favorable environment is important for uh, human uh, life yes mechanisms of implementation this is what is important if you allow me one more question I'm from Vodokanal uh, St. Petersburg I have a question to Mr. Volkov in your uh, talk you um, uh, gave an overview of uh, development of legislation uh, you went back to the Soviet times and since we uh, work uh, we discuss all this um, at an international conference I would like to ask you the following in your opinion how common are these uh, stages of um, the Russian or Soviet uh, legislation development in the area of water protection uh, because uh, this area hasn't been influenced greatly by uh, the social and economic development in the country. How common is it, how similar is it to uh, stages uh, of uh, similar legislation development in Finland maybe or any other uh, Western uh, states that we use as uh, good examples? Uh, definitely. Uh, during the Soviet times I remember the words uh, from uh, a, a song. I know there will be many uh, tons of steel uh, for a per capita of this population. Yes, of course, we used this, uh, that dogma to beat all other countries in industrial production. And that is why environment was of a secondary nature. And environmental laws actually appeared approximately from the beginning of the 1970s. And I believe that in European countries at that time, and in Japan and in the United States, um, these uh, issues um, attracted uh, had attracted attention much er earlier. I know from one of my uh, teacher, who is one of the founders of environmental law in this uh, country, he was bringing uh, some new ideas from international conferences, and uh, they formed the basis of the law on environment protection of 1990. It is not effective now, but uh, so. It here we see that we uh, implement uh, all these um, um, norms actively and we take into account our situation because we have so many um, towns which uh, simply um, developed around big uh, industrial enterprises and uh, negative uh, here we uh, see some negative social effects and uh, neg negative uh, environmental impact in Chelyabinsk for example uh, there was uh, there was um, um, uh, so uh, there was a case uh, they wanted to close down one industrial enterprise but actually um, they realized that no the, the environmental impact will be more negative okay so you can say that we are now seeing consequences of our urban 
development or a great emphasis on urban development. Yes, we are uh, dealing with our heritage that we uh, got from that industrial, air, uh, industrial time of the uh, Soviet development. Thank you very much. Microphone, please. Vladimir. Uh, Gennady, with all due respect, uh, I would uh, like to disagree. This is interesting. Well, I don't know how interesting it is, but colleagues, uh, um, I'm deeply convinced that uh, regulatory development in various times should be analyzed and studied, uh, taking into account uh, the broader historical background. Uh, I may be wrong, but uh, I'm a strong believer that any legislation reflects the realities of the historical process of that time. If we recall the time when we're trying to catch up with America and uh, take over America, well, that was a great time. Uh, a lot of equipment was produced. A lot of that equipment is still seen in various factories in St. Petersburg. So as we recall the Soviet times, uh, those could be compared uh, to the Industrial Revolution in Europe uh, uh, sometime before that. Uh, back in the early days of manufacturing in England, for instance, uh, there were very few people, I'm sure, who thought about protecting the environment. In Germany, when uh, industrialization happened, the Rhine became, the River Rhine became uh, uh, a dirty ditch. So a lot of things were happening back then. If we're thinking about some of the uh, <coughs> times, some of the more recent times, uh, there are a lot of similarities. Um, I think you will agree with me that a similar process has been happening in China. We uh, discussed, we negotiated uh, transboundary protection for the River Amur. We have several thousand of kilometers uh, of, bow of border uh, land with China. And I remember how difficult it was. I was directly involved in that negotiation uh, process. Uh, but the situation has changed in China as well. The Chinese uh, seem to have realized that this is not the way to do it in future and this is why they agreed to have an international a foreign regulator the Russian Federation that will be managing these transboundary rivers uh, there were more other aspects involved there but this is one of the most important aspects uh, they realized that uh, uh, there is a certain price to pay for the significant uh, growth in GDP nine eight to nine percent every year so they suddenly realized that it was unacceptable so today we're talking about an agreement that was not in 1964 the agreement and we're not changing it but now it works it is being implemented uh, competent officers from both countries are meeting regularly uh, and I'm now referring to the agreement with Finland. Yes, we do have issues regarding the Saima Canal, uh, but overall, I don't think there are any similarities here. There's no room for comparison. I think uh, we should compare between the eras in order to draw comparisons here. Uh, in every era, the needs of the country uh, involved these things. Uh, China developed rapidly and uh, they turned the blind eye to the environment for a, for a long time but finally in Beijing they realized that something needs to be done about the situation and uh, we can only wish them luck. Um, only, only the thing that uh, nowadays 
Uh, in Finland, the majority of our, our, our environmental legislation comes from the European Union. So if you look at these 27 European Union countries, the legislation looks quite, quite, quite similar. Mm, traditionally, uh, we have had a lot of cooperation in uh, legislative uh, areas uh, with other Scandinavian countries, especially with Sweden. And if I look back to history, water has, has always been regulated in, in Finland. As you know, we have a history when we were part of the Russian Empire, and then we had Swedish kings, and we have the oldest uh, water regulations come from the 13th, uh, 13th century, and the main topic was to keep rivers open so that the salmon can rise. So it was uh, protecting fishery and, and then it was the very important traditional way to get living. But uh, now I think that uh, uh, the topic which we now uh, discuss in, in Finland and all over Europe is that what is the best way to, to, to get this uh, best stand, environmental standard, is it uh, the regulation, or is it fees, or is it taxations, or is it uh, recommendations or soft law? And uh, as uh, it was already mentioned here, for example, in climate policy, um, the subsidies and taxations are quite good, but in uh, in this traditional environmental legislation, permitting is quite good, <laughs> still. Thank you very much. Shall we wrap up? Uh, let me tell you that we have worked for three hours already. Well, this is indeed a boundless topic. We could have... Uh, mm, set up a se separate uh, round table on concessions uh, that seem to be the buzzword of today lots of other relevant topics could be explored uh, now uh, drawing conclusions i would like to say that perhaps we can recognize that this uh, round table has been uh, very successful. Hopefully it will become a regular affair and that we will be meeting from time to time. We'll see you um, at uh, the next fifth uh, <laughs> legal forum. <laughs>